Well, thank you all for coming today. Um, my name is David Ashford, and I'll be teaching you for this next next hour and a half. We're going to talk about active shooter, and um, my background uh, is coming from law enforcement. So I got my start in law enforcement in 1988. Worked in the military as a military policeman. I worked down you know in my know where Hilton Head is in South Carolina. I was Beaufort County, a Beaufort City officer for a short time. And came back to Lexington, moved back to Lexington, and uh, spent some time with the Fayette County Sheriff's Office, all with the goal of kind of building my resume to get hired with Lexington Police. So I got hired with Lexington Police in 1995 and had the good fortune to uh, do my, my finish out my career there. Uh, I spent 24 years in law enforcement altogether, and um, in that time I got to spend uh, about 15 and a half of those on our tactical team with Lexington Police. So my on-ramp for this topic, unfortunately, was Columbine High School. How many of y'all remember Columbine? So I was on our tactical team at the time, and um, the next day after that had taken place, our team commander had pulled us all together, and he said, what are we going to do? Because we can't do the same thing they just did, because that didn't work. And it was right there. It was kind of a watershed moment in U.S. law enforcement about how we have to teach law enforcement to think differently about these events. And so that's where I started because he looked at us as a you know, several of us on our team. We have a team of about 24 guys, and there was probably seven or eight of us from, that were prime military, and they looked at us and said, okay, well, how would you do this? Like, how would you get a group, all of you, and go do this? Because that was very much against the conventional thinking of surround it, call for the tactical team and let them come in and deal with it. And now we can't do that. They're, they're just inside creating more victims. We've got, to, we've got to teach police to handle this differently. Since then, I've trained thousands of police officers from all across the United States. Uh, many of them have come to our schools uh, on this topic alone, and some of it is around tactical team training. I was a, I was a trainer, I was an academy instructor for, for a while. And so my history around this has been uh, pretty long, and it's terrible we even have to talk about this topic, to be honest with you, because it's not, it's not really enjoyable. It's a little scary every time we flip on the news, we see something else, you saw the footage when you walked in, and that was from uh, just, some, just some raw footage from downtown Louisville. So unfortunately, this is a topic that we're, we're faced in dealing with, um, and just like you know, our first events have taken place in, in schools and K-12, so K-12 has started to really kind of They've, they've, they've built more around their programs since then, and probably because of Columbine. Shortly after that, higher education got a little more aggressive. How many of y'all remember Virginia Tech? Right. How much did Virginia Tech cost? Do you remember how much it cost? What would you guess? By the time everything was finished, the settlements, the changes in the security, the, the awards to, for losses for families, legal filings, everything, what would you guess that cost, that event cost was? Million? Ten million? Forty-eight point two million is what that costs. That was the cost of that event. Um, and the more studies are out there that are talking about these things, and so we're going to get in, we're going to dive into some of these things, We've got some interactive things planned for us today, so we're going to push you outside your comfort zone just a little bit and, and just try to get you to think. First thing we have to talk about is the legal aspect of this because I can, we can teach, we can't cover every single thing that we think a person would do, right? And so in this training, we're going to try to share with you best practice. We're going to share with you uh, the reasoning why that this is the this is the best approach for uh, for this dealing with this kind of situation. But there's no training that's going to cover every scenario. This doesn't happen because as soon as you think you have, somebody does something else, and so. My goal today is to give you knowledge. So in that short period of time, from the time an event begins until the time the police arrive and deal with the suspect, I want you to have as much information as you can to be able to think critically and hopefully save your own life, save somebody else's life with you. Because many times uh, people haven't just allowed themselves to think about this, and then by then the stress is overwhelming, and people just, they, they shut down or they, they go into kind of what we would call in law enforcement condition black where they're just, they're, 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 they're overloaded and they can't, they can barely even make a decision. If you have an event, 
and, and, and it can be anywhere. And so the training, we'll talk about this, a lot of this in the context of work or your work environment, but this is information you can use no matter where you are. It doesn't matter if you're at work or if you're at a ball game with your kids or if you're at the mall or you're out to dinner. All of these things can still apply, and that's what we want you to allow yourself to think about and just realize this is, this is applicable almost where, everywhere you go. Um, one of the hardest things to teach, um, and, and we would see this in policing, but, but we see it also when we study the, uh, the events that have taken place and we are looking at uh, you know, trying to understand as much as we can about what happened, we see people will get into this, they'll, they'll, they'll just resolve, they'll, they'll get into one spot and then they can't move. They can't make themselves move. Like you watch, there was a shooting in an airport and uh, the guy had showed up the luggage claim and he had a gun and then he started shooting people. Well, people hit the ground and never moved. They stayed there and left themselves wide open to, to, be, to be hit. And so when that happens, we want you to be able to think and be able to transition from thing to thing so that you don't get stuck and you realize, okay, I'm here right now, but do I need to stay here? I need to move. Many of you have heard of Run, Hide, Fight. How many of you all have heard of Run, Hide, Fight? This was developed by Homeland Security uh, several years uh, ago, and it has been kind of a, a core curriculum where we've been teaching this uh, to people because we need something that they can they can get their head around that's simple and okay this is what we need to do when we approached this topic we saw a couple of gaps and that's how and that's why we built Ralph Ralph has essentially got the same elements of run hide fight but we've added a couple of things to it and here's why when people talk about running if you had run hide fight training before how many of y'all had run hide fight one two three so when you run how do you run Right? I, know, I know fast, right? but how do you run and why? Anybody got it? I'm going to run and I'm going to try to get myself away from whatever's going on. Is it best for me to run in a straight line or is it better for me to run at an angle if I can? At an angle. It's, it's more difficult for the shooter to hit me intentionally if I'm moving at an angle. So when I run, I need to be strategic and think about, I'm going to run to here, and I'm going to run to here, and once I get here, I'm going to plan to move and run from there. I'm going to look for my window, and then I'm going to move, and I'm going to try to, try to do that at the right time, and I'm going to think about how I'm going to actually do it. When you assess, and this was one of the things that was a big deal because people were like, okay, well, I just run, but we've literally had incidents where people ran in the direction of the active shooter because they didn't know and they weren't able to allow themselves to They saw people running, and so they took off running and ran right into the area where the active shooter was and ended up getting shot. So the ability to assess, not only in the aspect of running, but the ability to assess your environment is one of the things we want to talk about and teach today. Hiding, why would you hide? Where could you hide here? Where could we hide Think about where you work and you are in your workplace where you work every day. You're in your office, uh, you're at your, whether it's a corporate building or if it's at a branch location, and if you had to hide right now mentally, where would you go to hide in that room? All right? Behind a desk, probably behind a desk. Yep. And so a lot of people have not walked into their space and actually thought that through. They just allow yourself to walk in there and be in that space and go, okay, if this, I'm going to go from here to here. So this is the best choice I have. And if I, but if I can get out of here, I'm going to try to get out. But if I can't get out and I have to hide, I'm going to hide here. But I'm going to leave my options open so I can move or change strategy. Right? Not forgetting to silence your phones. Uh, and not for, you know being creative, being willing to think outside the box. These are these are things that uh, you know statistically you see see people make little mistakes, and that just gives the uh, gives the suspect a chance to hurt somebody. And you want to try to minimize minimize anything that makes you makes you visible. Lock doors. So we're going to talk about doors a little bit in this course, but statistically, having a door that locks is one of the highest percentage things you can do to prevent yourself from becoming a victim of an active shooter. 
the majority of active shooters will not waste the time to go through and try to penetrate a locked door unless there's a person specifically of interest to them and then they will then they will spend time on it but if you're in the building and you're just you're working and this isn't something that you're you know if you have the ability just to throw a lock and get into a safe part of that room a safety apex inside that room then there's a very good chance you can live through that event and it's just simply we, when we do these we do assessments and we look at doors and we look at how how people have doors uh in you know in their businesses or in their schools or wherever wherever we are and they don't have the ability to lock them they just they can't lock them at all um so locking doors is one of the things and we're going to talk a little bit more about doors in a minute and then fighting fighting is a choice you've got to make a choice if you're going to do it or not and it's a choice every individual person has to own you have to presume the police are not going to get there in time and then if you're confronted and and it's right now are you willing to do whatever it takes to save your life and what do you have in proximity to you that you can use to do that right what do you have uh, maybe your business does not allow uh, for carrying of firearms or maybe your business has has said well, well here's here's an option we want you to you know have these things you've got to play that through as if this is how it's going to happen and I need the, I have to utilize what I have close to me to be able to do this. Um, it's difficult because in scenario training, um, you can create some stress on people. There were some companies out here that were doing some stuff that was kind of over the top, and when they when they were doing these things, they were causing PTSD in some of the in some of the kids that were witnessing this, and so they so we chose to just do some different kinds of drills. We're gonna go through some of those today and just talk about that a little bit more. One of the first things that you've gotta ask yourself is do you have a strategy? Does the place that you work have a strategy for dealing with active shooters? Is it, is it written down? Do you know it? And have you, have you practiced it? Now, sometimes these get folded into the other things, a severe weather drill, or lost child, or a medical emergency, a cardiac, you know, something like that. The, the strategy, the goal, the purpose should be to really hone in on this and make sure you have a policy that's specific to this event and, and practice on it, train on it. Uh, unfortunately, we saw Uvalde, right? We've all seen, we all, we all saw the news and Uvalde. Uvalde is probably going to break records uh, when this settlement is all said and done. I think that I think right now it's over two billion is where it is today. The estimate on where it's going to finish out, we probably won't know for a while. And I'm not going to pick on Uvalde, but there was there's already been some reports that were released uh, about this. So tell me what you all know about this event, if anything. Is there anything about this event that you all are aware of? The police didn't act fast enough. Okay. What else? No one took no one took responsibility or nobody took command. Nobody took charge on the scene. Yep. Yep. Gotta be somebody in charge. The door unlocked to get in the building. Had a malfunctioning door lock that they all knew about but they didn't fix it. And they thought they had a plan, but they didn't train on it. Now, they did some training before, but that training was more of a, I don't, uh, I wasn't in the training, so I don't know, but it sounds as if it was not really took a deep enough look or dive effectively to help them prepare for this scenario. Uh, there's shared responsibility on this for sure. I mean, we saw the body cam footage and the, and the, um, and the officer's response to it, and it, uh, it is not how it should have happened. It is, just, it is not how it should happen. But go with me for one second. Um, so when we were teaching active shooter to these police officers, which this goes against everything that they have been taught beforehand. So now I want you, as a police officer, I want you to 
go into this building with your handgun, your rifle, whatever you have, and I want you to keep moving through the building until you encounter this person, and then I want you to gunfight with them as quickly as possible. Now, if you think of the case of Uvalde, where was that person at? He's in a classroom. What do you have in there with him? Kids. So if that officer is running this through their brain, I have to try to hit him, but I gotta miss you, and I gotta miss you, and I can't hit anybody else. I just have to hit him. That's a pretty tall order. That's a really tough thing to even think about and train for. And this is the this is the area where your police in Kentucky are working on this. We've we've this has all been involved. DOCJT, uh, they are they're. Uh, pressing this training out uh, continually and making advancements to it so that our Kentucky law enforcement officers respond better. And you saw evidence to that in Louisville. They, they, they got out and they went in and engaged, right? They went forward and they engaged. Nashville, you all saw, you, you all seen what happened in Nashville. I have a body cam footage for that if anybody hasn't seen it. Um, but that was an example of how to move forward, how to, how to, how to continue forward and save lives. Because they, they have no, everybody that's on the inside, is, they're defenseless. They have no way to defend themselves unless they've got a gun, right? And so the, the instruction to the officers was, you have to go forward and engage because they have, they've, got, they've got nobody else. You're it. And uh, we've done a lot of training with them to help them get themselves in the right mindset to be able to do it. But until those bullets are flying at your head, you really are not sure how they're going to react. But that's, but that's part of it. The key points of building a plan, um, you know, if, you, if, you've, if you've got training to teach uh, your folks about observation of people, uh, we call it uh, situational awareness. So we teach an officer how to be situationally aware when they walk in, because they're walking into people's houses, they're walking into businesses, they're walking down the street, they're walking down alleys or just at different places. But when an officer sees something, it won't be necessarily the word spoken, it will be the environment. And so teaching yourself to be able to key on things that look out of place. Okay, something's wrong here. This doesn't make, this doesn't add up. This is not normal. So I kind of know what normal is. We're all sitting in here, we got, we're at the table. But if somebody came in and they were maybe overdressed for the, for the weather, and they didn't speak to anybody, didn't look at anybody, but they just came in and sat down in the back of the room. Would that cause anybody to kind of go, what are, what are they doing? Yeah, right? So that's an example of your situational awareness, teaching, teaching yourself and your staff how to be observant and then action that. When they see that, it doesn't mean we have to run uh, uh, and uh, you know, throw the flag every time we see something that's a little bit out of place, but it means teaching them an appropriate response to Okay, these two people have been sitting in this car outside of our branch for 20 minutes. I don't recognize them. I don't recognize, I don't recognize anything about these two folks. Uh, let's, let's get a little bit, let's pay attention a little bit closer. You ready to lock the door? Okay, you ready to lock the door? Okay, you're ready to call if we need it? Okay, just pay, just, let's just watch and see what's going on. I'll tell you what, let's just have the police roll by and just check on them. We'll, we'll just, do a, just do a suspicious person check on them. Right? Could, you can literally, I've had neighbors who saw something that was out of place and we were dispatched just to go check on it and it was somebody who was getting ready to do a burglary or somebody who had just done a burglary and they had all the stuff in the car and because the neighbor was paying attention. Um, evaluating your surroundings. When, I, when we talk about evaluating your surroundings, everybody's is going to be different. Banks usually are very open in the front, right? We're very open. We want the customers to feel welcome and come in and engage with, uh, with staff and do their banking. Um, where can they get? Where can they move to if something goes wrong? So we want to look at that. But let's say we're not at work. Let's say we're at school. Let's say we're, you know, out to dinner. How many of you all, when you go to dinner, you want to pick a seat that kind of puts your back to the wall so you can see the door. Anybody in that camp? You're shaking your head yes, yes, yes. Card-carrying member of it, right? And my wife knows now. She just goes, I know you're going to want to sit here, so just go ahead. Um, but it's, it's, 
It's just how you are, but that's my, uh, my brain has been conditioned to want to do that, and so that's, I try to put myself in the best spot I can to be ready. Communication. How are we going to communicate an emergency? Do we have a way to communicate an emergency other than just yelling? Is there any sort of technology that we use to communicate we are in the middle of an emergency? And does that allow us to pinpoint where the problem is? Uh, or report, hey, this is Sam, and I've got Rita, and Josh, and Jennifer, and we're all in the maintenance closet, and we're okay. And we're here, we're okay, we're just waiting. Do we have a way to do that? We've had uh, an incident uh, that took place in Northern Kentucky where it was common for this, uh, for this group to come and go. You're going to hear an interview from one of the people who was in this situation, and it was common for people to come and go at different times to come to work, and this person hadn't shown up for work, and so there was an active shooter in the building that they were in and there was actually a picture, somebody took a picture and put it on Twitter, and that's how they knew that their employee was a casualty of this event. Um, but not knowing that there was an event going on, emergency, they walked into it and became a casualty of it. Um, rendering first aid. So do we have a way to render first aid today? Is anybody trained to do it? How many here have a, a basic like first aid CPR? Anybody have that? Good. Anybody here ever had to put on a tourniquet? Where'd you put on a tourniquet? And, and how difficult was it to put that tourniquet on? Yeah. The thing that was most surprising for me when I went through that training and had to do it um, was how tight you had to get the tourniquet to go on because you think it's tight enough and now it's hurting and you're still not tight enough and you have to keep going because you have to stop that blood flow. And having a way to do that now, what, you know, what can I use right now? I could use my belt, uh, I could maybe use a tie, I can rip off a sleeve of a shirt, I can do something like that. Um, but are, is the place where you work, do you have those things ready and are people trained to be able to do them? Bottom, bottom baseline survival. We've got to keep the airway open and we've got to keep the blood in the body to give that person a chance to survive. It's going to be painful if I have to put a tourniquet on you. That's okay. Advanced care is not too terribly far away, and we're just trying to buy time, because how fast can you bleed out? You can bleed out in seconds, right? If a, if a wrong artery is hit, you can bleed out in seconds. And then working as a team. Sometimes uh, just allowing ourselves to pr practice working as a team um, and this is all part of the plan. And when, you, when you set these up, when you do training and you allow your staff to kind of walk through these, uh, these scenarios and, and encourage that and, and require that team, team approach engagement, because if he's shot and he's hurt, I may or may not be able to pull him in and help him or even start to minister first aid. But me and you together, we could do it, right? But we don't really know first aid, but he does. And so we're going to work as a team. But in the meantime, we pull him in. We need to make sure we don't leave the door open for something else bad to come in where we are. So we want to work as a team. And who's, who's going to call 911? Or who's, who's reaching out to let them know where we are, what, what's happening? So we're going to do a little exercise. We're going to split you into two groups. So we've got uh, four, five, six. So we've got... We've got Four, four, so I'm going to ask you ladies, if you all, would you join that side and you'll join this side, you guys are over here, and so you all are a team, and you all are a team. So we're going to have five minutes, and we are going to work under the assumption that an active shooter, we've just been alerted, an active shooter is approaching this room right now. So each team using the current room plan for this environment, you're going to create a room plan. We're going to defend this room and the people inside. You're going to determine how you're going to render first aid, how you're going to communicate, and if the, occupant, and if the opportunity presents itself, how you're going to escape. We have five minutes. Separate into your two groups. Time begins now. Okay. Time. 
So let's talk about it. So we've been told we've got an active shooter that's on our, on, in our building and headed in our direction. So we're going to defend the room and people inside. What would you come up with on defending this room? So we decided to just get the bell because we were in Okay. So the fire rod, you can put a belt through the fire rod. Okay. 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 Very good. Very good. What'd you all come up with? <laughs> I, I was thinking that we would pull up a forty dollar strike and stand it on the door, make the door stay so I wouldn't be forty five years or something like that. Okay. What well, what would you use to do that? If you had to do it, what would you use? Okay. 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 Uh, who's who's communicating? <laughs> okay. So, so you're going to call nine one one. Who who can do first aid if you need it? Okay. So you're going to hit the gun out of the hand, hold them down, and do first aid. <laughs> okay. What else? Anything else? Yeah. It'd be tough. It'd be tough. Are these tables uh, bullet bulletproof? Or bullet resistant? So the exercise we just did is I'm, I'm kicking your critical thinking into gear about this environment in this room uh, and how would you do it. I like the belt idea around locking that door because that's... The, Right, so so there's no way to really keep it from doing that. So the best thing you got is, can I get over there and do that? And you could, that's feasible, right? That that could that could happen here. These are the uh, these are, are the fire rods that go up to help lock the door. And they disengage when you push on this part, but it's probably locked from the outside, maybe. But it could be turned with a handle and open. If I put a belt through there, that's good. That's a, that's a good that's a good strategy. Being able to escape, if we can escape, we want to try to escape. We just want to make sure we're escaping not into the direction of the shooter. We want to make sure we're getting out. Uh, one of the things that comes up typically is they'll talk about, I'm going to use this chair to break out a window. And so if you think about building glass, if you think about glass maybe on the outside of here, um, so it, takes, it takes a surprising amount of force to be able to break out a window like that. And you would think... Well, if I swing a chair, so we actually did this uh, Central Bank, one of the guys used to work with Central Bank, Shane in Lexington, they had a bank that they were taking out of commission, and one of the guys who worked in maintenance, he goes, you know, I've always wanted to try this, and since they're going to bulldoze this branch anyway, I just want to try it. And so he took the chair and picked it up, and this guy played football before, you know, before he got into the line of work he was in, and he swung as hard as he could swing, and it just bounced. Now, what some schools have started doing is they are taking and putting a hammer. They just go down to Harbor Freight and get an inexpensive hammer, and they've got that laying on a ledge or somewhere concealed close to that window so that if I had to, I could break that out. Now, somebody who's gone through glass breaking training for breaking out windows in cars, I can tell you that what happens if you do that? Your high percentage chance you're gonna cut yourself because it happened all the time. They gave us those little, those little hammers. It's got the little sharp point on the end of it, and that was used to pierce. And it surprisingly break a side window out pretty fast. Um, but they, you know, look, we had a, we were supposed to have a glove to be able to put on because your hand's going to go through it. We had options to use batons. I had to use a baton to break a a, a storefront window out, and it took for I, I completely destroyed my baton doing it. 
but I was trying to get in because I believed that we were going to save the life of it was a murder suicide and the guy had shot her and it looked like we could still get in there but um, so it's very tough so you all talked about communicating and having somebody designate because in those situations you, you somebody's got to step up and be in charge somebody's got to try to rise up and give direction if you feel confident to give direction um, but if you don't if nobody's given direction then what are we doing right then there, there's a good chance we're going all over the place and this is why this kind of training is invaluable to us because it will give us confidence to be able to make a good decision and then help coach people and get them to go in a direction. Now, so they're coming in and we it's imminent they're coming. Uh, and they're at the door and the door's probably gonna come open because we just don't have a good way to lock it. And you're close and we've got a chair, but one person versus a person that's armed is gonna be tough. Will anybody step up and help you? When you're in that moment, you want to think that I'll do it, right? You want to think, I'm going to step up. I've got, I've, I've got the courage. I've got the wherewithal. I'm going to do it. Very difficult to say if that's actually the case. When we did some of the scenario training that we did with our police officers, we did some very dynamic things, and we had a lot of variables flying around. We had smoke, role players, guns going off, and I saw seasoned officers get behind a car or get behind a tree, and they were scared to move because they had not been forced into this. And I saw other officers who I thought, well, they'll be okay. And they were rock stars. They operated like they were just on autopilot and moved forward making fantastic decisions and moving correctly. It's difficult, it's difficult to say how you're gonna be when that actually takes place. But if we're going to do it, you, you said, okay, I'm thinking about, I'm gonna try to hit the gun, I'm gonna try to control the gun. Um, very dicey, very, you know, to think about how would I do that, right? How would I do that? If I can control the gun and put that in a direction that's away from me and everybody else, maybe I can keep us from getting shot. But what's probably going to happen? Her gun's probably going to go off, right? It might burn you, might, might, might cut you, might, you know, it could be one of those things that could happen. Statistically, if we're going to go, if it's, if it's us, if the three of us are going to try to do it, one of us is going to go this direction, the other person is going to go and try to get the person on the ground, the other person is going to try to incapacitate them, right? It's the same thing that Run, Hide, Fight kind of, kind of hints on. But it's just allowing yourself to talk about that in, your, in, the, in the place where you're going to be um, and, and work through how would I do that. And it takes a lot of training. I mean, it, we, we had disarmament training, we had all these different kinds of uh, hostage rescue, things like that, where, and it's still just incredibly tough last resort right last resort I'm cornered I just don't I don't have any other options all my other options are done I've got to dis this is what I'm this is what I'm faced with now I would tell you try to never put yourself in that circumstance if you can but you won't you may not have a choice right so that's why we have to talk about it good 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 exercise one of the things that we've seen happening is around insurance Insurance companies have obviously, the, these events cost money. There's a dollar value to every one of them that happens because somebody is going to be paying out on this. And so what we're seeing happen is some of these, some of these uh, policies that are out there, people are starting to increase their coverage limits. And now the discussion, because we know insurance drives regulation, we know that those things are all kind of in the background and the, the, the other thing to be aware of is that, you know, when we go through trainings like this, when we have, uh, when we put policy in place and we do things that get our organization ready, if we have an event, you all know the same thing I know. Risk management's going to come in. Attorneys are going to come in. They're going to start asking for records. They're going to start asking for policies. When did you train on it last? Who put it together? Why did you select this? If you have all those things in place and those are, are established and, and you've, got, you've got good basis for how you're doing your training and how you're preparing your organization, then this can, this can help you. We've not seen specific cases yet. We've heard, but we, I can't give you, I can't cite a specific reference that insurance companies are 
looking favorably upon organizations who put these things in place and they review them. It's the same thing you would do with maybe OSHA or something you would do around some of those other uh, other high risk things. And they see that and they go, hey, you know, you guys have you guys have done done well to get yourself ready because if you don't have any of this done, then you're just adding a zero to the end of it, and that's not good. What we have seen statistically, the FBI releases, releases this. And you remember, whenever you see FBI stats, they're always one year behind. So it's not, when you think current, it's, it's always behind uh, at least a year. And so they have pointed to a 50, more than a 52% increase since 2018 of active shooter events. And, you know, the number, of, the number of wounded is increasing. You know, the number killed kind of flattened out there just a little bit. We had a dip in 2020, which is great. Um, that probably pandemic related, right? So a lot of people, less people out and about. Um, but we're, but what we're seeing now is it's spiking. Uh, you all, I mean, you all watch the news and see things just the same way I do. And it seems like anytime we turn on the, the TV, we see, unfortunately, another ev uh, evidence to that. But these are things just to be aware of. And you can't just kind of put your head in the sand and think that, no, it's not gonna happen to us because this is what happens Every time we go and we talk with these folks after we had an event, it's like we just didn't ever think it was going to happen to us. We're, you know, we're over here. Nothing like that happens here, but unfortunately, nobody's immune from it. It doesn't matter. Small town America, uh, it, it doesn't matter. I would ask, uh, I would ask our officers uh, when we first started doing this. I said, "How many of you all carry a gun when you go to church?" And they just looked at me like I was. That's you can't do that. And I said. Why not? Well, we're here for church. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, we're in church. I said, you all have the knowledge, you have the tools, and you have the ability on how to save people's lives in this event. And unfortunately, we've seen churches become targets of this. I just attended a, a, a training forum last week uh, in Cincinnati that was hosted by Homeland Security and FBI specifically on, on focusing on protecting houses of worship. And it's across all, all types. Doesn't 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 call out one over the other. Um, but when people gather together like that, that that makes that makes an opportunity potentially happen. And so when you think about being in church, and I've, I've sat in, I've sat in church multiple times, and I'm thinking about okay, if this happens, and I'm sitting here, and they come in, and I'm part of our church security team, so I do a shift, I do a rotation every month and a half, where I'm in the lobby, and I'm I'm there, and there's another guy that's kind of on the back. But, you know, 10 minutes into service, all those doors are locked. you got to come through the front to come into the, into the building. So I'm going to hedge my bet and try to make it hard for you to get in and come somewhere else. But on a given day, you know, I would say we've probably got seven or eight, maybe nine people in there that I know of are armed. And I don't know how many are in there that I don't know are, which is scary, too, because something happens and they think they're helping. And now we don't know who's, who's good guy, who's bad guy. And that can create a problem. So, but that is all when you think about strategy, just like business and strategy, houses of worship are looking at those same kinds of strategies and same kind of problems for their, for their places. So now we're going to talk about surroundings and we're going to talk about the two differences. Now, some of you will probably know this, the difference between cover and concealment. Cover is something that's going to protect a bullet, protect you from uh, a bullet penetrating it and going through it. Concealment just hides me, right? We all know that. So, in this room, is there anything in here that we could use for cover right now? Is there anything in here that is, gives us cover? See anything? Maybe. It's this wall made of. Sounds like drywall. Probably studded drywall. Is studded drywall protected from a bullet? It'll definitely interrupt it, but it but it may not stop it. Right? If it hits a stud, maybe. Yeah, that's Yeah, depending on what kind of you know Yeah, twenty two maybe. Feels like a solid corridor. Um, nine millimeter, probably getting through that. Two, two, three, definitely getting through it. 
So from, from a cover standpoint, not a lot. Sometimes I'll have, I'll have folks that will say, well, we stack all these tables up in a row and then we could have like a bunch of layers. Realistically, could we do that? Probably not. There are companies that are actually making technology. It looks like that table, looks identical to that table, but it's ballistic. We've got them. And so that table, uh, you all see the rolling tables as you go into classrooms and get two people behind them and they flip up so they nest together and they'll have a little monster panel on the front. Whole thing's ballistic. Level three, level three A ballistic, which is gonna keep, we tested it up to shotgun slug, nine millimeter, 45, 357, kept all of them out. So that technology is out there. People are thinking about it. Now, would you want a room full of those things? That'd be nice, but man, that's expensive because those things are about $10,000 a piece, right? So we can't afford to do that. But if I had maybe two or three of those, and I put them in a, at an advantageous spot in my classroom, like if I was in a school, and I, and I had that, or I had a big conference room, and I needed some place to get behind, I could potentially use that and create a little fast safety shield that I have to know that those tables stay in the right place all the time. And they don't get moved around, or you know, the, the, the setup and breakdown team doesn't take them and put them in a closet, right? Because they look like a table. So what we're gonna do is a little exercise here, and we're gonna look at rooms. So what are the pros and cons for this environment? Open, I can see a long way, yeah. Not too many. I don't know that that's a balcony. It looks more like a, maybe HVAC or maybe some, some uh, softening for air, maybe. Someplace that big, they're probably pushing for it in. What about those things on the left side coming down? Is that, could that be, is there a chance that's ballistic? It looks structural to me, so that potentially could be a spot. Yeah. We wouldn't want to stay there and stay there and camp out. We'd want to we'd want to get there for a second if we had to, and make a plan. Yeah. One of the things we had to teach police officers when we first started doing this, especially schools. So a lot of your schools are uh, poured poured concrete block or poured walls. And uh, so that bullet's probably not going to go through those certain walls, the big long hallways. But the way a bullet will behave, especially like a rifle bullet, but a, but if they would always want to hug that wall whenever we were doing things because it felt like I had protection there. But what happens is if you look at ballistics, they will hit that wall and they can come off the plane of the wall and travel along the wall about 12, 18 inches off the plane of the wall as a ricochet. And so we were trying to help them understand that's not necessarily your best plan to be there. To, you know, maybe, maybe that's not your best plan. Uh, but it changes. They're in all kinds of environments. What about this? What are the pros and cons for that environment? Yeah. Those look like they might have some advantage to us if we had to. If we had to. Where can we get out? Anything look out of place? What's that? Mm hmm Potentially, yeah. Looks like you got steps going up there. It looks like steps may come from behind, but it looks like it could get you up to another level. Yeah. So what you're making your brain do right now is go through scenarios and really analyze what you see in front of you. That's what you're doing, right? Your critical thinking is kicking in, and you're looking at that differently 
Not that it's a nice little uh, unique uh, restored wood coffee shop, but you're looking at it in a different way. And that's the goal of this. That's one of the things that I want to encourage you out of taking this training today. What about this? Anybody ever go into places like that? Anybody ever try to run down those rows to try to get out? Where are the exits at? Yep. Yep, maybe. Yep. Just like we... Yeah, dark. Just like they tell you when you come on to, when you fly on a plane, they say the exit, the closest exit might be behind you. All right? So when you walk into that room and you think about how will I get out? Where am I going to sit that lets me move in a way that lets me make my way to an exit or the, the, the exit that puts me in the best spot? Because if the problem starts over here, I'm going to try to exit that way. But the problem starts on my side, I may have to exit that way. Right? And how am I going to get, how am I going to get myself together? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's tough, right? There's just no good spots to get to. But that's the that that's the exercise. Your brain is looking at that and going, "Okay, now where am I gonna? Where about? Where do I go?" So the next thing we're going to talk about is doors. We consider doors a stopwatch, and the reason we consider doors a stopwatch is if uh, you all are kind of looked at this one, but if this door, let's say we let's say we did or did not have your belt strategy at play here, let's say it was just like this. How long would it take you to get through that door if you intended to like get through this door from the other side? How long would it take you to do it? Maybe it's locked. Yeah, assume, assume it's like it is right there. Mm -hmm. Take you a minute. Yeah. What if you were at anybody ever go, go to Home Depot or Lowe's and you got how I many of y'all ever re replace a door on your house or replace a door like in your you know closet door, bedroom door, whatever? How long would it take you to get through that door? If you had to get through that door, how long would it take you to get through it? No time. Right? What about that door? Take a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something something to get through that strike and something to get through that lever to be able to let you release it and get through it. Doors are stopwatches because, like I said at the beginning of the training, if I have the ability, if I can lock that door, and if I know that this is the safest spot I can be in because we know from our training that we said, okay, if we have an emergency, this is the place we go, and we can lock it, I've just, incre I've just increased the amount of time I'm giving myself to let those first responders get here and do the work, and I'm also giving myself time to formulate the plan for what I'm going to do if that person comes through the door. Because just, because just because I have a door there, the question is, can I lock it? And so if you think about those, think about those environments where you work, and you think about, can I lock that door? These are some of the simple things that you can do that will be that will be much more advantageous is from a, from a money standpoint, some of the stuff you can correct is very inexpensive and you don't have to put, you know, ballistic rated material all, all over every wall. It's just not feasible, right? But we can do certain things that make it, make it better. So now what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of a different exercise, but we're going to focus on the door. We're going to stay in our groups and then we're going to, this group, you all are going to focus on those two doors. And this group, you all are going to focus on that door. And so we're going to talk about, do an assessment of it, 
and why why you do what you do as far as defending this room, right? So we're going to defend the room. These are the doors we have to defend it. You're going to come up with a plan. You've got about five minutes to tell me why you would defend it, how you would defend it, and why you would make the choices that you make. Ready? Go. Come up with on your on your door. How's the frame constructed? And what's the door material? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And obviously that door swings out. So how much room do I need if I'm if I'm trying to get in there? Because we talked about putting tables and chairs and things up against the door. Um, if I was bad guy, could I do this? Let me move on. The the thing you want to protect against from over barricading is if if you get into that. So what? So we put tables and chairs and things up against there, and then he did that, right? He he stuck his hand through, and then he shot shot some people. So now getting help in here, we're gonna have to fight through that to get things out of the way, so we can get people in here to help them. And so the and barricading at a at a door like this, the belt idea. I like the belt idea. Um, could I hang right around the corner? Like, could I be right here? All right. This is probably not ballistic, right? This just opens up and becomes more of this room. But if I knew he was coming, this has got a little bit. If he came through here. That might give me an opportunity if I if I decided we can't get out. There's nothing else to do. If this is the, if this is it, then maybe right here. So as soon as he comes through, somebody moves this way, plan for somebody on that side. Just makes you critically think about it. You got to think about it, think about it. It's it's rotten to think about this scenario, any of these scenarios, right? But what I want you to do is look at the door and realize the 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 value it brings in being able to secure it uh, because statistically they're not going to waste the time to try to go through it unless they are specifically targeting you, right? There's something that's happened and you're the target, then they may take extra steps to either make sure they can get to you or they may, they may wait until they know you're going to be in an area that allows them the opportunity to engage you. What did you all think about your door? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's even companies that have come up with little hasty wedge things that you can use and put in there to lock doors. Because uh, if you don't have any other way to do it, then they've got these little things and they'll just like sit them right there by the door and you know you can take that and put it in place and it gives you a way to lock it. That one's tough because it's opening out this way. Uh, so, but if I added a, a, a typical commercial deadbolt lock on that, nothing high security, nothing like big, not talking about, you know, DOD or anything like that, but just a normal, 
I can go down to Lowe's and get a, a, a outdoor grade uh, security single throw deadbolt lock and put that on there. How much did I increase this, the, the, the strength of that door or my, my ability to be safe behind it? It just takes one move, click, and I did it. So good. So this is these are these are again these are the things that I'm wanting to encourage you to think about and kick the critical thinking into gear and think about the door and the environment differently. Next thing we're talking about is communication, and so where you are today, do you all have a communication tool that you would use to alert the, the staff where you work that you have an emergency happening? If you have one today, what do you use? So Teams, use Microsoft Teams, okay. What else, anybody else have, have another, another solution? Okay. Yeah. Right. So, are there any anybody else got something different that they're using? Because I've heard people say, uh, "What's the other one?" Uh, that's a, it's the group. Uh, group me. Group me was one that people mentioned. Uh, there's several different communication tools, especially when you get into bigger buildings like maybe this building. There's they've probably got some different uh, kinds of apps. Something that would pop up on the screen if the, so, so if a professor was give, during a lecture and uh, and they've got the screen popped up like I do here then that would that would come in on their network because they knew that that PC belonged to the university it already had that loaded on there and that emergency could show up and go okay you know I didn't hear anything we're in here talking I've got a bunch of people uh, but I know now I need to move and it's actually telling me okay the emergency is here the person who reported the emergency is here so now we know that's where it is, and we need to go into our lockdown strategy or our evacuation strategy because we've, we've already planned this, we've already rehearsed this. And the bigger thing is getting people back together or accounting for people. So people who are managers, people who are, are leaders, the question's gonna, you know, fire, the fire chief's gonna come or the battalion chief or whoever, the police, they're gonna come and say, do you have, are your people accounted for? Do you know where they are? That's a hard question to answer if, if you don't have some sort of a technology or work it in your plan to say, yep, I've accounted for a hundred of our staff. I'm still missing, I haven't heard from three people. And uh, you try to get a hold of Terry, you try to get a hold of Doug, and let's call them and, and, and text them, blow them up until we can find out if they're okay, find out where they are. And if they're not responding to us, where did we last know that they were? Where were they at last? Yeah, yeah. those are, you know, you have your, uh, in, in policing, we were always thinking about the reunification point for, for, for kids and parents, right? So if you have an event, Columbine, for example, how many different police agencies showed up that day? Over 35 different law enforcement agencies. And they all didn't have the same radio that worked and talked. But they're all in there. One of the deputies that was working that day, his son was in the cafeteria when Klebold and Harris were in there, and he's texting his dad, please come and get me. They're in here shooting people. Now, how hard do you think that deputy drove and was ready to go charging in there to go take care of his kid? And so we talked about that in the training with them to say, look, you, you, you got, I understand your passion to, to do that, and I can't say as a dad I wouldn't want to move forward either, either. I want to do it. I want you. I want to take you all with me. I want to get a team together, and we want to go in. Um, but that kind of that kind of stress is very real. And then after the event settles, now we're going to start thinking about what we do next. How do we account for everybody? So there are there's technology there's uh, uh, and tools out there that you can get, and they they don't necessarily blow the budget up, uh, but they're useful and they can provide that emergency communication for us in an emergency um, and help us account for and answer the questions like all these things are. Like some, some of these, one of the ones uh, that we know about is a, a company called Crisis Go. Crisis Go is probably one of the biggest K-12 mass alert 
tools that's out there, and they use it so they can they can t literally take a roll and account for all those kids, and they map. Okay, you're going to uh, reunification point A, and that's over behind the football stadium at the snack stand. You all are going to B, and that's the soccer field on the other side, right? That way, we'll, but we always had to set those up far away uh, from the event because all those parents would drive straight to the scene and block traffic, That I mean, block ambulances, and you can't have that. So you've got to give direction and say, hey, listen, this is where you got to go. Parents go here. Um, our company does a lot of work with retail, and so they we've unpacked some of the ones that have affected, like Myers and Lowe's came and shared with us uh, some lessons learned from some events that they had uh, had dealt with, and they had an active shooter that happened at a school adjacent to one of their business locations, and everybody came to the cause they directed them, hey, come to the parking lot over here. Well, then you got parents showing up, and parents are getting together with kids. And then there's a few parents left that the kids haven't shown up yet. And the parents are starting to realize my kid may still be in the school. And how are we dealing with that? Who's going to take, who's going to take the lead from our organization and be ready to interact? And what about teaching those other employees who just had to deal with that because they're in there, they're seeing it. How do we get ready to deal with that? And that's, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother thing to, to train on as well. What I'm going to play for you, I hope I can get the volume to work well enough. Uh, this is an interview from the fellow I told you about earlier that went to work and actually had, they walked into one of his, one of his coworkers actually walked into this event. So they did an interview with him. It's a phone interview. So, and we've got the air conditioning system running. So I'll try to adjust the volume up so we can hear it well enough. Um, but uh, just listen, it's not very long. How long is going to play? Well, I may not be able to get it to play. I don't hear it. Do you all hear it at all? Yeah, unfortunately, this is not going to play here for some reason. I don't know why. So in this interview, he essentially, he, he talked uh, to the interviewer about the fact that they had never, never really practiced on a plan um, and that it was confusing because people were running in different directions and they were trying to tell each they were trying to let people know hey there's an active shooter in the building lock down and hide and this employee that worked on his floor with him was coming into work and walked right into it and became a casualty and the active shooter shot him there was another person who literally was running and this was right as he was starting to go into hiding and he knew that the shooter was down from him and the person was starting to run in the direction of that person he came out of where he was hiding and grabbed the person and pulled him in and said no don't go that way come with me he's down there and so they hid and then the other co-worker that walked in that was coming to work walked into it and became a casualty of it and they didn't realize uh it who it was until they saw the picture posted on twitter of him laying on the laying on the ground and he was deceased so that's, that's how they found out, and they were trying to account for everybody once that event took place. I think there was three people killed in that one. 
but that's what his interview is basically walking through from his perspective of we didn't know what to do. Like we, we hadn't even talked about it and it happened to us. And the it's not going to happen here, but it did. Yes, it's not going to play. So we've talked, I've talked off and on about what law enforcement is going to do. And this was one of the things that was difficult to, to, get, to get folks to understand what the police are going to do as they come into this. And I've got some body cam footage to show you some, uh, some live scenes. You all remember uh, the one in Las Vegas uh, that was just, it's been, what, five, six years now? Um, oh, the name just left me. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, the law enforcement, they, they, they have trained on this now across the country, and they, are, they all now acknowledge we could be sent to this. So in doing that, you, you're gonna, if you find yourself in the middle of this, they're going to they're gonna be coming at you, and you're, they're going to they're gonna look at you the way they have to look at you, which is an unknown. And it doesn't matter. To, they don't, they, to them, they don't care about you may be the president of the bank, or you may be a customer, or you may be, you know, nobody, and you're just going through. They are going to assess you as a threat. That means there's a good chance they're going to have a gun pointed at you or in your direction until they determine you're not a threat. They may handcuff you. They're probably going to be yelling commands at you. It's going to sound offensive. It's going to, there's probably... I, there's most likely going to be profanity involved. I'd like to say there's not, but there's, there's a good chance it will be because these men and women are scared as well. They're, they're trying to calm themselves down as they go through this, and everybody's going to be at a different level to be able to handle that stress, right? The thing I can tell you is, regardless of where, where you find yourself, this is what they're looking for right here, this. If I can't see this, then you're an unknown. So if I can't see your palm, if I, if I can only see this, if I, can, if I can't see your palm, then to me, this is, this is an, you're an unknown to me now. And until I see the hands and the palms up, and after I see those hands and palms up, I'm going to quickly scan the rest of you to look and see if I see anything stuck in waistbands. Are you trying to hold anything up against your body and not swing your arm like you're trying to hide something because you don't want me to see that you've got it underneath your jacket? And follow, follow their instruction. They're going to they're gonna probably direct you to another group who's going to direct you to somebody. They're going to question you. They're going to ask you. They're going to be going fast. And they want to get, the, they wanna get, it, get to facts as fast as they can as they're trying to figure out where is this happening, what's happening. Try to pay attention and give a description of the shooter. We used to do this in one of the courses that I taught is we would have a, a person come in without too much notice, and they would be a person who worked with the university, we would teach at EKU, and, um, and they would walk in and talk to us up in the front of the room for just a few minutes, and then they would leave. And I would wait about 10 minutes until the person had gone, and say, give me a description of the person who just came in here and talked to me uh, a few minutes ago. And so those students would be, oh, like, I don't remember, so they'd have to write down what they thought the description was, and then we could see how granular they could get with how tall were they, how much did they weigh, what, you know, give me some characteristics so I could identify them. And uh, that was called a Kim's game or a keeping memory game that we would teach. And um, so it taught them to be observant even when you really didn't think you were necessarily having to be observant. Um, they're going to interview you. They're going to identify you. It's okay. The whole entire place has become a crime scene. And... They're, they're going to try to work through putting all the pieces of the puzzle together, and it's going to be and it's going to take months to understand how everything unfolded. Just know that they're not necessarily looking at you in an accusatory way. They're looking at it from a safety standpoint, and they're going to try to move as fast as they can because they're all of them. The goal is the same. I want to get to the shooter as quickly as possible and stop them, whatever that means. Um, so this is video from Las Vegas. I don't know if this is going to play for us or not. I'm, I'm suspect if that other one didn't play, this may not play either. But I think we're connected to the internet, so it should play. 
Let's see. They're telling them to take their fluorescent vest off to make them less of a target. So they just made a choice to go to the right instead of the left because there was no cover from that side. So they just made a choice so they could stay behind cars as they moved down in the direction to be able to get over the fence. Did we try to jump over one of those fences? Staying behind the car, using the engine block as cover. These people are in the bar and they're just hiding from this event. They're just trying to stay concealed. This is in the hotel. They're just going to control him. They're going to pat down for weapons, ask questions. They're going to take a picture with their phone, get his name, and let him move on. So you get the idea of how tough this is to navigate this, and you think about, um, you know, have they been in your building? Do you have you invited the police to come in? Because I would encourage our officers, you know, when you're out riding around and you're and you're making your checks and you're doing patrol, go visit. Go go just go inside, visit. Now, I'll usually, see a uniform officer show up, they get people get nervous. But you're like, oh, look, I'm just here. I'm just kind of looking at your looking at business, just talking with you. Uh, how's it going? Anything I can do to help you guys? Uh, just trying to put my eyes on the on this place so that the first time I'm not showing up when the radio's gone off and everything's gone wrong and I'm racing there trying to come up with a strategy about how do I get through this building and where's the front um, and where do I tell other people to come to and what is this place? This is the this is the nicely convention center and I know it's uh, 22. 55, 2355 Nashville Road. And I came in from what I believe is the south entrance down by the, by the banquet area. I think that's where I came in. So I was able to get in there and I can direct other officers, hey, that door's open, you can get in that way. Um, law enforcement response is, uh, is tough. Um, it's, a tough. it's a tough ask. I'm gonna show you something else really quickly too. You all may have seen this um, from Nashville. 
This is what was released to the media. It's not graphic. It's, it's dynamic, but not graphic. Hallways, backpacks, doors, desks. Where can they hide? What have I heard? What am I hearing? And now they've got information that they're on the second floor. Sirens going off, lights flashing. Flip the safety off. You hope you never have to do it. But the the reality is, is they understand that that can be a part of their job, and um, and they need our support. Uh, um, U.S. law enforcement right now is uh, in a in a hiring and personnel crisis. I know Lexington personally is over 100 officers behind where they want to be. State police is, Louisville police, everybody is just not drawing people to the profession the way they used to. And, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of folks that we would normally attract that uh, are looking in a different direction. So we, uh, we need to, as a community, make sure we are supporting them and uh, trying to get behind them with the tools they need. They, they're, they're, they're all capable of making a bad choice, right? Bad, a, a bad decision. But 99% of them go to work every day to do the best job they can for the right reasons, right? They're, they're, and whenever we found someone who was not doing it that way, we tried to get them out because they made everybody look bad. And so when, when, we, when we trained officers, we were always looking for uh, those characteristics that would make them not be the person. I'm thinking of them when I would tell my instructors, I said, you know, train this person that you know that's coming to your house at one o'clock in the morning because everything went wrong. Who do you want showing up? The best person we could get or just anybody? You want the best person we could get. So think of it that way. Let's train them. So now I have a question for you. The two questions are, are, are important. Do you have a trained and certified safety team in your, in your place where you work, where you, where you are, uh, where you're engaged? So a safety team, somebody who's going to take the lead and kind of own that, right? So they, they may have another job. They may be, you know, they could be the manager or they may be a, a physical security director or whatever. But those, those people who get safety team certified, they can be the, the main point, the resident expert that really helps your organization answer the questions and do the things to prepare to deal with this and other, and other emergencies, right? But having a, a trained safety team is just critical. Um, and another thing is if, if you have an attack, we've, uh, we've actually started training on safe rooms and how to work in a safe room. What is a safe room? Could that be a safe room? Maybe. But what, is it, what should be in there? And then what do we do in that room if we, if we consider this a safe room for our organization? So... When you identify those things, it's part of just doing an assessment. A lot of folks know they need to do something. They know that, hey, uh, we haven't really done anything around this. I need to start somewhere. I need to do something. And a lot of times they come to us and they'll say, look, we're, we don't really know where to start. And so when we encounter that, we send a group to do a, a facility threat assessment. We've also built a way that we don't have to send a group of people to do it. You can do it but you're gonna use some technology. 
Because if you're the facility director, because you know this facility like the back of your hand because you work here every day, I can give you the tools and, and some quick training on how to gather the data, and then that information can move back and become a, a threat assessment that you can then go back to your organization with and say, look, here's where we're, here's where we're behind. Uh, this is what we should probably address first and why. Okay, we only have this much budget this year to do this. That's good. What should I spend the money on? Let's spend the money on the thing that's the uh, highest threat, that is the greatest vulnerability. And let's invest in that and let's fix that first. And then, okay, so what else? Okay, these are areas we're doing good, but these are the top two that we really need to focus on. And then you can go and make your change, right? Get, fix, fix the condition, because a lot of these are things that really, some don't cost anything. It's just policy, or it's, you know, it's some small adjustments that would not be a, a big hardship on the organization, but if you, if you don't know what those are, then you may just overlook them just because you don't know. And so that's why having a threat assessment is, is valuable because it will be somebody who is asking questions from the outside who is not gonna, not gonna look at it from one lens or another lens. You're, you know, you're the CFO of the bank and so I know you're just gonna be looking at pennies. Uh, you're, the, you're the personal security director. I don't want you to look at this like I haven't done my job, but you know, you're gonna make me look bad. It's not about that at all. It's about making this environment as safe as we can so that our, so our employees feel safe coming to work uh, and that we do have a good plan that they can make good choices if we have an event. Because what we hear employees say is um, that the organization is telling me you value me when you are doing things like this to increase my safety at work. That, that tells me you care about me, right? And that's a good thing because that, that way they know, hey, we're, we're, we're trying to do this right. So I've talked a whole lot this morning. Um, what questions do you all have about what we've talked about today? Opposing viewpoints. I've heard this differently someplace else. I don't know why this. Is there anything like that that you heard today? Hear anything today you had never, hadn't heard before? Hear anything that was something new? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You see, you see the run, hide, fights in there, right? But the part that we felt was missing was assess and lock down. How do I assess? So learning how to assess whether I'm moving, but we, you all actually did some of that today. You assessed this room, you assessed these doors, um, and you assessed strategy. How am I gonna move? How am I gonna take care of myself? How am I gonna take care of other people? What if I don't have a choice and I'm gonna have to engage this shooter? Here's, here's, my, here's my thinking, here's where I'm gonna go with it. And it, and it can change, right? It, it, it will evolve, but where people usually I rode back on a plane with a, a fella uh, coming back to Kentucky, and he and he's working doing something with uh, electric motors somewhere. I don't know. And uh, and I asked him. I said, because I was, if I'm sitting in the seat next to you in the plane, I'm going to ask. I mean, I'm like, hey, do you all do active shooter training? And um, and he says, oh yeah. He goes, we had a guy come in from the FBI, and we did this whole thing. We were chasing each other around with Nerf guns. I said, when did you guys do that? When did y'all do that? Oh, 2017. I said, have you all done anything since then? No, not really. Anybody join the organization or leave the organization since then? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I'm, I'm sure we have. Probably something you should visit. Probably something you should think about doing because that's, that's what's going to happen. If you have an event, that's what they're gonna, those are the questions they're gonna ask. Um, and our goal is to help you not only put the organization in, the, in as good of a place as they can, but give that individual person knowledge they can use, not just in their place of work, but anywhere they go. Because these things, th these things, we went all over the place. We were in airports, we were in theaters, I mean, we were in coffee shops, and your brain was already working out ideas on how would I work through that. Same, same. You can go anywhere you go, you can do that. What questions do you have about Ralph? What do you, what do you like about it? What do you not like about it? What do you think about it?
Does it make sense? When, if organizations will share an after action and we review those and we kind of try to get the, we'll try to get the uh, breakdown afterwards to try to understand where those things were. And so just like Uvalde, just having a door that would have locked that could have prevented that event from getting into that building. He might have still run around, but maybe that could have kept him from getting inside. Locking a door. Does the door work? Schools, we see teachers will take a little rock and put it down in the corner of the door. Looks like the door's shut, but it's not, and the person gets to pull it open because they're going to run outside and go smoke or get something from their car or whatever. And there's technology that will tell you, hey, that door is not shut. And so if the door is not shut, if that door is associated with a camera and I can look on there, I can say, well, it's Miss Smith. She's going out to the parking lot again. I need to go over and talk to her. Miss Smith, you cannot look, prop the door open. I know you want to go outside. You can't prop the door or leave it open. This is a security risk for us. I know, but it's just going to be a minute. I understand. But let's, let's be honest. It only takes a second for this to go wrong. So please, let's, let's not do that anymore. Right? And that, that's part of the thing. A safety team can help with have, help and have those conversations or escalating it if we need to with the managers so that they're not doing something to create a risk that we, we, think, we've, we think we've addressed. What other questions do you have? Is there anything in this that you hadn't, that you, that you got that you didn't expect to see? Anything that you did or today or that you looked at that you thought, hmm, you know, we're going to talk about that? Yeah, yeah situational awareness. Uh, the, the, the course we teach on situational awareness specifically. Uh, just to teach you how to pay, we te we're essentially teaching you to pay attention to how a police officer pays attention. So I'm looking at your, a lot of the communication is more nonverbal than it is verbal. And so I'm looking for behaviors or I'm looking for uh, mannerisms that lead me to ask more questions. Like if I'm walking and I won't look at you on purpose, and I'm sweating, or I, maybe I have this disconnected look on my face. Uh, some places we call it the power of hello, right? So just greeting somebody. Hey, how you doing? And you won't greet me back. Which, by the way, I'll tell you is different because in Washington, D.C., my wife was there for an assignment. So I'm from Kentucky, right? So we say hi to everybody. I walk through the grocery store. I go through place, And I say, hey, how you doing today? How's it going? And they look at you like you are from Mars. And um, so that was really weird for me <laughs> because that's how I was. And I just kept doing it. I was like, well, I'm, that's, just, that's just where I'm from, so that's what I'm doing. Um, but you could definitely see the difference in posture and even in some cases fear. People just walking around. We're in a Safeway grocery store in Washington, D.C. But um, I was looking at the doors. I'm looking, of course, at two armed security guys up in the front. They weren't police, but they were armed and they had all the stuff on, but they were not law enforcement. But they were hired by that store to be there because they'd had problems. So, and I'm looking at them going, okay, well, is, is that going to be good or bad if something goes wrong? I don't know. I don't know. Could be bad, maybe. But that's where the tra it gets back to training. It, it is really, honestly, it is about training. It is just about training. And you don't have to do a ton. Uh, nursing, my wife works in nursing. And so nursing is an awesome area where they're, they're dealing with this a lot too, right? The pandemic showed us how important nursing was. And, um, but they have this, they, you know, nursing is the, um, is the um, highest percentage of workplace violence of any profession, even over law enforcement and corrections. More incidents of workplace violence, that's somebody else's data, not mine. You know, another interesting fact, nursing is considered the most trusted profession, more than doctors, more than attorneys or anything else. And so we were, we were at a, we were at the KNA, which is the Kentucky Nursing Association, and we were hearing them, but they've got a crisis going on too. We're over 10,000 nurses short in the state of Kentucky right now. And nursing touches all of us from cradle to grave and every place in between. It doesn't matter where you're, what community you live in, where you what your situation is. Nursing probably has some sort of a touch and impact. 
And, um, but they have a real problem because they're having difficulty recruiting people to go to that profession because of the amount of workplace violence and even the bullying that goes on, which I was shocked at, but they all admitted, they owned it. They said, oh yeah, yeah. It's like, you all are nurses, you all are supposed to be nice. <laughs> but they are, they're incredibly rough on each other. And it's probably the way they were led when they were younger in the profession maybe, or it's a rite of passage kind of a thing, and I get to do this to you, kind of like, you know, the upperclassmen on the football team might, might make the junior classmen, you know, you guys got to carry the water, y'all going to have to carry all the gear in and out, and, and it gets worse. I mean, you have some of you all know, played in different sports, They're not just talking about football, but anything. And um, so they're, that's, that's a problem for them. And so we're using, you know, some of those things and those discussions to try to teach them because they have such a high incidence of workplace violence, we want to teach them some strategy on how they can be safer while they're treating patients and interacting with the public. And some of it are very simple things and some of it is not, but what they weren't doing is training and seizing that little uh, opportunity at the beginning of the day. Police, when they start the shift, we've got 10, 15 minutes when, when, the, when the day begins. You come in, they call roll, and now we're gonna go through some information, we're gonna take a debrief from the shift that's going off, and they're gonna tell us, oh yeah, got traffic blocked for a house fire over here on this street, so you guys need to send a couple cars over there, relieve them so they can go home. Uh, we got guard duty going on, a prisoner who got sick uh, from that car wreck, so they're over there, we need some, somebody to the hospital. So, and then the detective bureau is looking for these people. If you see them, they're looking for this. We're looking for this car, it was seen in the, in the area of a crime, and you have all this data dump, right? So all that dumps out. But we're all there together anyway. So we, Lexington, we were required to also revisit some training at that time. So we said, hey, tonight we're gonna practice on some handcuffing or we're gonna practice on uh, some of our escort technique. So we're gonna just take 10 minutes here, the two, two moves I want you to work, and we're gonna work Faulkner Frist, and then we're gonna work uh, the knee, comprocranial knee strike. You guys partner up, you guys partner up, you guys partner up. I want you to go over there, get 10 reps each, you get 10, you get 10, practice that for a few minutes, I'm gonna watch you. And then they just go over here on the side and they practice just for a minute just for a minute. We're not doing a deep dive, we're just gonna revisit it. And then they're done. Go out and get to work. That little bit of reinforcement, sounds like not much, right? I've literally had officers who left pro call, drove to their first call, turned out to be a fight, and used the technique we had just practiced on, and they said, I would have never done that if we hadn't just practiced it, and he goes, oh yeah, we just practiced how to do that, I'm gonna do that. And so they did it and it worked. So that reinforcement, that training, helps them keep it upfront and not, not so far back because people will, in, a, in an emergency, they will default to their lowest level of training. Fine motor skill, out the window. Gross motor skill, hopefully will stay with us enough that our legs can move, right? Because they've been so, people so scared, they're like, I tried to run, but I couldn't because my legs just said, we're not going anywhere because of just the fear. But I hope these, I hope this, these topics and this time was valuable for you. Um, you, have a, uh, you have an assessment there. You have a, uh, a, a sheet for feedback and critique. Um, it really is valuable to hear your feedback uh, for us because we are always looking for ways to make this more valuable or hear about the the aspect that you felt like was uh, good or bad uh, or something you would add or like to, like to know or something that we didn't cover, uh, it's valuable to us because it helps us improve uh, the courses that we teach. So if you would fill those out for me, I would greatly appreciate it. My card's laying there if anybody needs it. Um, if you've got more questions after this or if uh, you, need, you need more help, my information's on there and please feel free to reach out anytime I can be of assistance. Any, any other questions or comments forward before we, we're done? Okay, I'm going to check with Jamie real quick and make sure there's nothing else that she needs.